Shalom, brothers and sisters. This is Dr. William Snevlin coming to you from With One Accord Church Ministries with the second main component or class in our series on how to become a spiritual warrior, prayer warrior, however you want to put it. And, you know, um, I just felt led to explicate on the concept that we need to know if you're in combat, if you're in warfare, which by definition, if you are a believer in this sinful fallen world, you are behind enemy lines. And we need all the allies we can get. And beyond our brethren and sisters in, in the church, <coughs> excuse me, we have another realm where we can have allies to help us with our prayers and with our warfare, etc., And of course, that would be beings, celestial beings from the angelic realm. Hallelujah. So today we're going to, it's probably going to be a two-part thing. We're going to talk about the angelic realm and how it relates to warfare. And also we're going to talk about some things that some believers are doing that are actually very dangerous, involving angels and so on. So, before we get into that, you know, I'm sure a lot of you, if you're intercessors, you do, you know, ask the Almighty for help in the, well, in the way of angels. You might, let's say if a loved one is traveling, you might ask that the Lord would send angels to keep watch over that person and get them there safely, or similar things. And that's wonderful. That's perfectly great. <clears throat> Nothing wrong with that. But before I get into this mistake thing, I think it's kind of important to lay a foundation. And that foundation is basically talking about, okay, what are angels? What does the word mean? And what is their nature? And also of critical importance, what is their hierarchy, their organization, if you will. So, to begin, angels are spirits. Typically, they do not have bodies, physical bodies as we have. Um, however, as we understand from both testaments, um, if Elohim wills it, he can send down an angel or angels to appear as human men. As far as the Bible is concerned, we don't seem to have any female angels, although I, really angels are not really sex, uh, sexual in that sense. Yeshua tells us that in the New Testament. Um, so there are spiritual beings that can assume human form at the will of the Heavenly Father. Okay. <clears throat> the word angel means messenger and it comes from the greek word angelos and of course in hebrew which is where we first find angels is in the in the torah uh the word is malak and it also means messenger and it can mean both a celestial being or it can mean like an earthly messenger sent from you know somebody to another person so that's the basic meaning. But as we know, if we have any familiarity, familiarity at all with the scriptures, angels do many, many things. And, if, and of course, I'm not even going to get into the fact that there are fallen angels. That's going to be another conversation. But if it's for, for the purposes of today, we're going to be talking about the good guys, the celestial beings that serve the king of the universe, Yeshua HaMashiach. Okay, let's look at the heavenly hierarchy. Um, first of all, why does there have to be a hierarchy? Well, the word itself implies a structure of authority with somebody at the top and then different levels. Uh, and, and I think most of you understand that, but the idea is, like if you have an army, you have generals at the top, 
perhaps even, you know, like in America, we have our commander in chief, <clears throat> supposedly. And then we have, you know, generals and colonels and majors and, you know, so on and so on down the line, all the way down to, you know, the non-coms and the privates at the very bottom. And that's how a military force has been structured really for thousands of years. Even we know back in the days of the Roman legions, there was a structure, a hierarchy to those things. And I think that's probably been true at least for 2,000 years or more. So even in heaven, we need to have a hierarchical structure. And of course, at the top of the divine hierarchy is Yeshua. And under him are all of these angelic beings. So it seems as though, I mean, there, there have been scholars from various forms of Christianity down through the centuries, right up to this very day, that have made a study of what is called angelology, that have dug very deep into the um, into the scriptures, into the uh, apocryphal scriptures, the deuterocanonical scriptures, and you know some of the the writings from the intertestamental period. In other words, after Malachi, but before the birth of Yeshua to kind of come up with the idea that there are basically nine orders of angels in this hierarchy. And the lowest, of course, is the order of angels. And make no mistake about it, even though these are the, you know, they're like the privates, if you will, in the heavenly army, they are incredibly powerful. I mean... We've seen, Mary and I, my wife, a lot of angelic beings in our day. Um, and they are frightening at times. That's why if you'll notice, almost every time an angel appears to someone in the Bible, the first thing they say is, do not fear or fear not, or some variation of that. That's because their appearance is, in fact, awesome in the full sense of the word, not in the way people use that word now. So even an angel can wipe out thousands and thousands of soldiers, as we see in the Old Testament. And, you know, they're, they're incredibly powerful, just one angel. So just because they're at the bottom of the heavenly hierarchy, don't underestimate them. Don't you know, in any way disrespect them. Uh, you know, like all these stupid ideas that you see in movies are, for the most part, either disrespectful or downright blasphemous. You know, even celebrated films like It's a Wonderful Life, where you've got this kind of goofy, befuddled elderly guy who's an angel. Let me just say one quick thing about that. I, implicit in that concept, which is a, this is a common idea. A lot of even Christians believe that when you die, if you're good, you become an angel. That's where angels come from. And that isn't really true. We as Christians, if we live a good life, you know, when we die, we'll become like the angels. Yeshua tells us that. But we are not going to become angels in the sense of you die and all of a sudden, boing, you get wings and a little halo. That's silliness. So anyway, just putting that aside, angels are awesome. They're extremely powerful. And you can't really in any way overestimate how powerful they are. Then above them are the archangels. And it appears from Scripture, we only have, okay, I'm going to talk about this later, I don't want to go too far into the weeds, but from Scripture there seems to be at least seven archangels. Because one of them, Raphael in the book of Tobit, which is an, an apocryphal book, in other words, and let me explain that, that means it's not in the Protestant Bible except the very first edition 
of the King James Bible had the Apocrypha in it. But it's in all the other branches of Christianity. The Eastern Orthodox have the Apocrypha, the Roman Catholics have it, the Coptics have it, you know, all the Marianites have it, all these different... So, you know, it's highly regarded as being a legitimate corpus of Scripture, even if it's not in the typical Protestant Bible. So, in any event, he says, Raphael, he says, I am one of the seven who stand before the Almighty, the throne. And uh, from that, people have adduced that there are seven archangels, at least, of whom he is one. More about that later. These are more powerful angels. There aren't as many of them because there are myriads and myriads of angels. I mean, nobody even, except obviously the Almighty, can even count the tens of thousands and thousands and thousands of angels. So, then we have next in line, and again, this is, this is somewhat arbitrary, but it's generally conceded that the next level is what is called principalities. And Paul mentions this in, in uh, Ephesians. The principalities are a higher level of angel that are, are ruling over cities. Then above them, we have the powers. And they rule over territories or states, you know, depending on how your, your country is, is arranged. And then, above them, we have the dominions. And these are the celestial beings that rule over entire nations. So, for example, there is a celestial being, a dominion, that is over the United States. There is one that's over Canada, over Mexico. You get the idea. So, these, this is all part of the hierarchy. Now, Beyond that, we have the thrones. And these are, these are mysterious. We don't know a lot about them, but by the name, we assume that they are somehow involved in the throne of Elohim. They may very well make up his throne. He might li I mean, you can find old iconography where well, you will see the throne of Elohim being made up of of angelic beings in the form of a, of a throne. But we don't really know because the scriptures don't really tell us that much about this. Um, next, we have, these are really wild, we have the Ophanium. And again, these aren't well understood or well known. It's just a Greek word for wheel. And of course, if you're a student of scripture, you know I'm talking about these mysterious angelic beings that show up in the book of Ezekiel in chapter 1, in chapter 3, and in chapter 10. And they seem to be underneath the throne, whirling around, and they're described as living wheels, wheels with the Spirit in them. And what are they like? The wheels of Elohim's Merkabah, his chariot, you know, we can speculate about that, but again, these are beings that are so lofty that if really un we really understood their nature and their purpose, our heads would probably, you know, explode. So this is very high up. We're now in the seventh of the nine hierarchies. So above them are, and this is a word that most people have heard, are the cherubim, which is plural for cherub, or keruv in Hebrew. And these seem also to be associated with the throne of God, or maybe perhaps the chariot of God, the Merkabah. Uh, again, we don't know. They appear in Ezekiel, in the places I just mentioned. And they also show up under a slightly different form in the book of Revelation as the four living creatures. Uh, pretty much the same idea. And of course, John the Apostle is drawing upon an enormous amount 
of Hebrew scripture from the prophets, from the writings, in his ex explication of the um, apocalypse, of the uh, book of Revelation. So that is the idea of the cherubim. Nay, I teach, and you may have heard me say this in other, other uh, environments, but if you really look at Ezekiel 1 and Ezekiel 10, I believe you will see that even though in Ezekiel 1 we have these creatures that have the head of a lion, the head of a bull, the head of a man, and the head of an eagle, that if you go to Ezekiel 10 and read it carefully, you will find that the true nature of a cherub is that it is a winged bull. And what's interesting is if you're all for, at all familiar with um, Middle Eastern archaeology, you will find that all throughout the Middle East, you'll, you'll see like bas reliefs and carvings that go back thousands of years of winged bulls. And of course, part of the problem is like everything else, and I think I just talked about this a couple of, of teachings ago on YouTube, but is that humans fall into idolatry. And so they, 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 somebody may have seen a cherub at some point, and oh, I want to worship that. And so we have all of these bull figures down, you know, the, there's Serapis, there's Egyptian version, there's, you know, the fact that Zeus turns into a bull and rapes Europa, you know, all of this weird stuff in paganism, the golden calf I may have mentioned already, but, you know, all of this goes back to the fact that whenever fallen human beings see something wondrous or numinous that they don't understand, they immediately want to take it and put it in a box and worship it. And that that doesn't work. I mean, that's forbidden by the Most High. So that's that's kind of the best understanding we have of cherubim, cherubim. Uh, okay, then the final one, and and you know, let me say this too. This is the attempt by devout men and women of Elohim down through the centuries to try and unpack this vast, incredible treasure of Scripture about a very difficult element of the heavenly realm to understand. And so it's like none of this is like set in stone. But this is the best we can understand it. Seraphim, the, the highest order, um, these are beings of fire, pure fire. And they appear most prominently in, the, uh, in Isaiah's vision, in Isaiah chapter 6, where he sees, you know, the Almighty high and lifted up and his train fills the temple. And he describes these incredible beings that are so lofty that all they do, day and night, I mean, it really isn't day and night in heaven, but you know my point, eternally, they fly around the throne of Elohim, and they cry out, Kadosh, 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 you know, holy, holy, holy art thou, Lord our God, you know, all of this beautiful hymnology. And, they are right in the blazing furnace of the glory of Elohim. That's why Isaiah is sitting there like, oh, you know, like, woe is me. You know, I'm a sinful man. He thinks he's going to be reduced to a flaming pile of cinders at any second because he has seen, you know, well, he didn't really see the Father. I'm sure what he saw was Yeshua, the pre-incarnate Logos, the Memra, sitting on the throne. But be that as it may, even though these these mighty seraphim, and, and let me just parenthetically say this. Oddly enough, the fiery serpents, quote unquote, that that the Almighty sends against the Israelites because of their unfaithfulness in the Torah, they are called seraphim. So whether or not, you know, I mean they were fiery snakes. So whether or not that's what these entities really look like or whether this is a somewhat different thing that was sent from heaven as a punishment, we don't really know. But in any event, 
These seraphim, as they fly around, they have six wings, we are told. And with two, they cover their face. And with two, they cover their bodies. And with two, they fly. And they do this out of, now get this, out of shame out of the fact that even though they are probably the most lofty beings in the universe outside of the heavenly you know trinity they are embarrassed by their unworthiness to be so close to the burning fire of the kabod the glory of elohim so they cover themselves because they feel unworthy now think of that the next time you want to enter into prayer or praise or worship because you are and I'm not I'm not saying this to say don't don't do this I obviously we need to pray we need to worship him but just be respectful understand that when you because you have this incredible birthright as a believer that you can go you know, before the throne, boldly, but don't don't get cocky, so to speak, um, because you are walking where angels are f afraid to tread. So when you pray, when you worship, you know, be conscious of the fact that you are in the presence of Elohim, who is a burning, consuming fire of absolute glory and beauty and love.